Hi, I'm Paul Feinberg. I'm host of UCLA Anderson's podcast. My guest today is Professor Leo Burstyn. We'll be talking about uh, educational trends in emerging nations. Leo, welcome. Um, I know you have a paper you've recently written. Um, so why don't you begin by sort of bringing our viewers and our listeners up to speed on, on uh, what the paper was about. First of all, thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure to be uh, part of the podcast. So I'll talk a little bit about my paper. So. When you study, look at developing countries, emerging markets, and in particular Latin America, you observe that even though many things are getting better, you see a lot of improvements, uh, education is still a big problem, it's a big challenge in those countries. So I decided to study and look, really try to understand how households in countries like Brazil and poor areas of developing countries make schooling choices. And you know, really look inside the house, the back, household black box, and try to see how they're making those decisions, and maybe if you understand how they make those decisions, you can understand why kids are not going to school, why dropout, dropout rates are so high, why truancy rates are so high. So that's what I do. I develop a methodology and work together with the, the government there, local government in the city of Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, really to understand how families make decisions there, schooling decisions. Talk a little bit about some of your findings. Okay, so by introducing this new methodology and in uh, working together with the local government there, we learned some new uh, facts about uh, the decision-making process of those families. So first of all, we learned that uh, many times the, 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 the preferences and the opinions of the parents and the children, especially adolescents, don't really match. You know, uh, as a rule, we observe that parents want the kids to go to school much more than the kids. And, and what's happening there, these parents have they have a, lot, a, big t a hard time convincing their kids to go to school and enforcing school attendance by their kids, by their children. And, you know, and that's just something that people haven't looked at before, this conflict in, within the families uh, in terms of uh, the school attendance decision. And we also observe that uh, the reason why parents want their kids to go to school are not necessarily the ones we've been thinking about. Uh, in particular, in dangerous areas like slums in Brazil and other countries, uh, an important component of, of parental evaluation of schooling is not the kid that not that they want the kid to learn, but they want the kid to be safe and off the streets. So we learned that parents want the kids to go to school, kids don't want to go to school, and parents want the kid to school, but not because they want the kids to learn, because they want the kids to be safe. So there's a lot of new things that we learned from this uh, piece of research that can help us formulate public policy in, in countries like the one I'm studying. And, you know, we can talk a little bit about the policy implications, but I think, you know, it's really interesting to map research to, to, uh, to policy implications in contexts like those. Yeah. Before we get to the policy implications, and we will, wh where do these attitudes come from? Are, are they um, embedded in the culture? Um, um, it doesn't sound as if people are going, and no one's encouraging kids to go to school just for education's sake. Is, what is the sort of the yeah. history of their attitude? So, yeah, this is a very good question. So first of all, we need to understand why parents and, and children have different perceptions about schooling. Uh, we elicit their, their beliefs about the returns to schooling, about how much they think their salary is going to increase if they go to school. And you observe that parents' perceptions are much higher than the, the children's perceptions. So if you ask a parent, uh, how much do you think your child's uh, salary would increase with one more year of schooling, two more years? And if you ask the child himself or herself, the numbers are really different. So the parents have a much higher perception about returns to schooling. Also, the parents are more, seem to be more patient. You know. Also, the parents realize that their life didn't go so well and they didn't go to school. They, they make the connection and think, you know what, I think you should, you should really go to school because otherwise you end up like me or something like that. And the child is really myopic and don't really observe that. So we see this di divergence in opinions. Now, back to the other part of your question when you ask about why is it that parents really value safety more so, or you know, at least uh, as much as you know, learning and acquiring skills in the classroom. Well, first of all, in, in, in several countries like Brazil, and in, especially in urban areas, uh, crime rates are very high. And parents know that if the child is not in, in, in school, the child's probably gonna be on the streets, you know, subject to violence, crime, drug dealers. So parents really value that. They're aware that it's really important to make sure the child is off the streets. And also the fact that the, the parents don't really value so much learning and skills acquisition in the classroom relates to a big problem in developing countries, especially in Latin America, which is the low quality of education. Public education in Brazil is not really good. If you look at the uh, international comparisons, 
systematically uh, the performance is, is, is not really impressive. So parents seem to be realizing that, you know, it's important to be in school, but not necessarily, you know, to be acquiring skills. So that's something also that we learned from this, you know, uh, experiments, this uh, implementations that uh, we did that there. Are there options other than public school? Are there private schools or parochial schools that yeah. parents have options for there? At this uh, income level, you know, we're talking about families with a per capita household income of about $100 per month. So, and those, so really the only option they have for them is are like public schools. And you know, private schools are uh, there, you know, if you talk about Brazil and other Latin American countries, but they're really more for families with a higher level of income. So that's pretty much what they have available for them. So let's wind back around to some of the public policy implications. What's top of mind for you when, when, we, when we think about policy? Yes, so, so first of all, I think many policy uh, ideas really target the parents. They think, you know, the parents are the problem. We need to convince them the school is important, to, you know, and then they will make the child go to school. But it seems like, you know, the parent, at least in the study, seem to be, you know, to realize the importance of school and the, pre the problem seemed to be the child. And if you think about it, I mean, when I was a child, when I was an adolescent at least, I, I didn't really want to go to school, right? I know, and I'm, I might be more, more nerdier than this, these kids were studying in terms of, you know, uh, wanting to go to school, but still. So I think it's, 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 it, it's intuitive to think that many times the adolescents don't want to go to school. And I think you should, you know, target them. And so uh, make school more interesting for them. Uh, you know, teach them the importance of going to school. If you look at the numbers, 41% uh, of the dropouts between 15 and 17 in Brazil uh, decide to drop out. They report that they decide to drop out by pure own lack of interest. They just were not interested anymore. So, you know, stimulate this interest. So this is already a straightforward implication. Also, we realize that parents in Brazil uh, might have a hard time monitoring their kids or get information on what the kids are doing. And they, they seem to value that a lot, you know, and they think, they seem to believe that if they are informed, very well informed about when the child is going to school or not, like real-time information, they think they can, they can take care of it. So, so we're designing and implementing uh, text, text message policies in Brazil, and I think it's going to be implemented in other countries as well. The World Bank seems interested in the idea, which is, you know, every time the child misses class, you can send a text message to the parent informing the parent, you know then the parent has this, this piece of information. It's much easier for the parent to enforce school attendance, to wait for the child at the end of the day at home and say, hey, I know you didn't come to school today, you know, and have the, that conversation with the child. So that's another policy implication. Another thing that we learned from the paper specifically is that, so the paper actually deals with a policy instrument that is used in Brazil and also in, in over 30 countries now, which is called conditional cash transfers. So conditional cash transfers are cash transfers made to the families, but conditional on some sort of behavior. And many times they are conditional on school attendance. So in Brazil and other countries, uh, families with uh, adolescent children receive these cash transfers from the government monthly, but only so if the child attends school. They say, if your child attends school 85% of the days this month, you get paid. If not, you don't. So... This seems interesting in the paper, but many economists thought that this was not the best strategy uh, to, you know, redistribute money or to, you know, uh, promote school attendance in particular because, you know, economists think that people know what's better for themselves. So if you impose some restrictions on their behavior, it's not what, what, what should be optimal for them. You just, just give them cash and they decide what to do with the cash, the cash that they get. And then what we learned from this paper is that families really value this type of, of ca conditional cash transfers. Actually, if you ask a poor parent, would you prefer to receive $50 per month uh, conditional on school attendance, which is if your child goes to school, you get the money. If not, you don't. Or $60 guaranteed. You know what they say? Pretty much all of them say I prefer $50 less, but only if my child goes to school, which is, doesn't seem really intuitive because they giving up certain money for money that is not going to be paid for, with certainty and, and it's less. So, but we learned that they do that because they know that if, if the payments are made only if the child goes to school, that will help the child go to school. The, the child will 
that will provide uh, incentives for the child to go to school. So we learned that those type of uh, policies, ca conditional cash transfers, might have this additional role, really, of promoting school attendance by solving this intergenerational conflict, so to speak. So this is another policy implication of, uh, of the paper. Yes. Yeah. Now we know that um, over the last, I don't know how many years, but the, Brazil has, economy has stabilized, and I know that that the nation is trying to become more of a global power or, yes. or you know, improve its stature globally. Does these, do things like these cash transfers, incentivizing kids to go to school, does that represent um, an acknowledgement by the government that for them to really compete globally, they need a well-educated or a relatively well-educated population? Yes, so this is a great question. So, so the interesting the interesting thing about conditional cash transfers is that they have two elements. One is the cash element, and the other one is the conditional element, right? So let's, let's talk about both. The cash element is, seems to be playing a, already an immediate role now by, you know, all these people are, that were off, you know, the formal markets, not, you know, the consumer market or credit markets, they're getting, being cooperated by, get, because now they receive this extra uh, money and they, they just can go out there and buy you know, stuff and, you know, and simulate the economy. So this the cash component of conditional cash transfers is, seems, to be f help, it seems to be helping uh, simulate the economy. And uh, we saw a huge boom in consumption credit, consumer credit in Brazil, and, and uh, the low-income families were leaning, leaning the way, actually. So that's helping already the economy now by, by, you know, reducing inequality and incorporating all those families into the economy. Uh, that's one side. And the conditional side, which is the fact that now those kids are more likely to go to school, I believe we're going to see that more in the future, but I guess there's an implicit uh, thought now that, you know, at some point we might need an educated, uh, an educated population, you know, to continue our growth path. So, but, I, I, you know, with education, we never really see the, the, the benefits now. We see them uh, down the road, but I'm, I'm, I'm confident, you know. And this, this is actually... It's actually a big question also in uh, democracies like Brazil, which is uh, do governments have incentives to invest in education? And that's, you know, that's another question that interests me a lot, which is if you think about those governments that don't only want to re-elect themselves and you see a, a, their citizens are poor, they really need money now, do, do, they, do they really care about what they're going to get in the future if they have all those like, very important needs right now? So you might think that governments in Brazil don't really have, in countries like Brazil, don't really have very strong incentives to invest in public education because of trade-offs in public spending. They might get more uh, returns in terms of election prospects uh, by targeting other types of spending. But the conditional cash transfers are interesting because the government is giving cash to the families, which is, which is good for the families and good for the government in terms of re-election prospects, but it's also tying this to to a schooling outcome, so it, it's it's a good way to tie those two things together, and you know I'm, I'm, I like the, this type of uh, policy design a lot. Yeah. Do you have any plans for further research in this area? Any anything you plan on exploring yeah. down, down the line? So I'm I'm, I'm yes I'm, I'm doing some other work on uh, education in Brazil. In particular, we we help in, in particular we we're, we're helping um, local government of the city of, of the state of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, implement the text, pe text message uh, instrument that I described, whereas uh, when the children miss school, the parents get text message notifications in real time, informing them of the absence, you know, to help uh, parents monitor their children. And we're, you know, and we're combining this with sending text message to parents and to kids, uh, informing them about the returns to schooling, you know, if you go to school in more year, this is what's going to happen to your salary on average. You know, trying to, to provide information to them, both information on the benefits of schooling and information to parents about the school attendance behavior by the child. So we're doing this. We're working together with the government there. That's one piece of work I'm doing there. We're also trying to look at uh, preschool in Brazil. We're trying to understand the role of preschool of, um, and then trying to see if you, know, if you have the ch child going to you know, early child education, like preschool, what happens to the mother if that frees the mother to, you know, go to the labor market, and what happens to the other siblings, if the older siblings have more time now to, to focus on their own uh, school. So we're trying to understand, you know, the, the household 
consequences of having uh, the, the younger children going to preschool. So, because there are some preschool programs in Brazil, public preschool. So, kind of related, but in a different way, yes.